Micah's right. God's doing something here this morning. Have your heart open to him, would you? And if you're watching us online in this service, you're streaming the service, you've probably noticed the communion elements up here on the platform. I want to give you some time right now if you're home to, to grab some communion elements and prepare at the end of the message this morning to take communion right there at home. And I want to just say something. Uh, if you're an intercessor, please be praying for me right now. Um, I'm not preaching out of the sermon series in 1 John this morning. Um, God began unpacking something in me this week that I am strongly compelled to share with you. So if you'll just allow me to sort of go off a normal sermon script, um, I want to do that with you. Holy Spirit, come and speak, Lord, through me in words that, that only you can articulate and share. And above all, Lord, have our hearts focused on you this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week, the week began Sunday, Monday, so rather it was just hard for me. It wasn't a bad uh, Monday, to, uh, Sunday, Sunday, Monday. It wasn't bad. It was just uh, in the services and in my quiet time and everything, I just felt rather flat. Um, and immediately, if you're like me, immediately you start asking the Lord, you know, have I grieved you somehow? Is there something that I've done that's, that is offensive to you? And you start searching. But honestly, I talk to the Lord a good part of Monday, Sunday, and Monday. Uh, and the Lord didn't point anything out to me. So, um, so I went into Tuesday just like I normally would with all the duties of Monday. Monday's bu busy with staff meetings and and uh, so days gone before you know it, and, and I got into, into Tuesday, and I got a phone call from the, from the uh, state overseer, uh, the bishop for the Church of God in Pacific Northwest from Yakima, and he asked me, he said, Tuesday night, I know you have prayer meeting on Tuesday night, but he said, would you be willing if we arranged, he said, I have a monthly meeting with all of the Church of God pastors in Oregon, Idaho and Washington, and would you be willing Tuesday night to come on uh, the Zoom call with me at 6.30, and you can share for 15 minutes. I want you just to encourage the pastors and share for 15 minutes, and then, then you can uh, be free to get ready for your prayer meeting. And I thought that sounded okay. Wasn't quite sure what I was going to share. Wasn't really in the mood to share, uh, but I said okay. And so uh, Tuesday, the day went through. Uh, pretty normally, and Tuesday night, I went into my office early at 6.30, got on Zoom, and pretty soon, I'm looking at a screen uh, with 33 faces of pastors from three-state area. And the minute I look at that screen, my heart starts to move for them. I see some tired faces. I see some discouraged faces. I see some hopeful, longing faces. Don't know any of them except for the, the bishop from Yakima. And so um, I began to, I just began to share. I was kind of groping to begin with as to what to share. I just began to, to share a little bit of, of some of my testimony. And, and the more I shared the more the Holy Spirit showed up in me. Uh, I think all of you perhaps have experienced that when you start to do something or share something and uh, suddenly the Holy Spirit starts to stir and I started feeling a stirring and the 15 minutes went by and it was uh, 10 to 7 and I'm still sharing and the bishop is saying, keep going, keep going. And, and, and the Holy Spirit is moving in me and I'm starting to feel a burden for these 33 pastors and, um, 
and it's five to seven, and I get a text from Pastor Vanessa. Uh, have you made arrangements for somebody to lead prayer meeting uh, tonight? And I, I, I said, I just finally told, uh, you can't fake it when you're trying to do something on your phone and be on Zoom. And so I said, sorry, I'm supposed to be leading a prayer meeting right now. Please, please forgive me. And I, I texted her back and didn't know that she was home with a migraine. So uh, I said, please grab Pastor Aaron and have him just open for me. Uh, uh, I got to just obey the Lord here. And uh, I don't know what happened, but Pastor Aaron didn't get the message or or she didn't get the message because uh, seven o'clock went by. And at this point, I don't really care about what's happening here. Holy Spirit is stirring my heart. These pastors are in my heart and I'm leaning in. And some of them now are weeping uh, uh, on the Zoom call. Some of them, one little dear African-American pastor lady who was very close to begin with, now has got her hands up in the air on the Zoom. When you know when you're worshiping on Zoom that God is moving, right? She's got hands in the air and we're having many many revival here and at 715 and I know that that uh, Dr. Pat Wright has got other people that got to speak and I said no I really need to get into the prayer meeting now and when I walked out here and some of you maybe don't know me very well just uh, so I hope this doesn't come across like I think I'm all that which I'm not but I walked out in the lobby and the Holy Spirit was literally I don't know how to put this in words Holy Spirit was literally all over me and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't shake what I'd been feeling in that room. And when I got in here, Pastor Ron had done a cr- tremendous job. The prayer meeting was off and running. People were praying, and I couldn't, I couldn't hold it back. I stopped the prayer meeting. I interrupted the prayer meeting because one of the last things I'd said to those 30 three pastors, right? Pastoring churches that we don't know. We don't, when I, one of the things I liked about riding motorcycle was all these little churches you'd drive by, ride by in the country, and I'd find my heart going out to whoever that shepherd is. And I promised these pastors, I said, as soon as I get in that prayer meeting, there are several hundred people in this prayer meeting that are, are, that are going to, we're going to pray for you. We may not know your name. We may not know what town you're pastoring in. We may not know what battles you're facing, but we're going to pray for you. And uh, if you were in the prayer meeting, then you, you, you would have, you, this would have made sense to you because the minute I shared that, Whoa, Westgate Chapel lit like an afterburner and began to call on God. People lined up at the microphones, began to call on God for these shepherds dotted around the Pacific Northwest. And you called on God for them because whether you know it or not, they are already on your heart. So that just kind of Tuesday night kind of turned my world upside down. Well, Tuesday, I'd also gotten a call from from FPIW's uh, policy uh, manager, uh, no, no, director, I don't know what his title is, but Brad Payne, who represents us and the issues that affect us as Christians in Olympia. And he'd called me on Tuesday and he said, look, I don't know if you've got time and I'm sorry this is last minute, but there's a bill coming up for subcommittee hearing tomorrow, Wednesday, and, it, it, and the state wants to, wants to loosen the controls on physician-assisted suicide. In fact, they want to make them, I'm paraphrasing now, right? Give me some liberty. They want to make them so loose that your neighbor could sign the papers and somebody would ship the medicine to you in three days so you can off yourself. And Brad has told me before that when they're fighting these issues that are so biblically based, they look around there in Olympia and there's not a pastor to be found. And I hadn't even started sermon prep yet and my schedule was jammed, but I said to Brad, I'll I'll come down. And so early Wednesday morning, Pastor Bill and I got in a car. We drove, drove down to Olympia. We spent some time at Brad's house praying, and then we headed over. We did a little tour of the, of the Capitol, and then we ended up in this hearing room with probably 30, uh, senator, sen- 30 uh, legislators. And, uh, and I was so intimidated because who am I in that environment? 
I mean, we got doctors in front of me that are talking about how people are suffering and how much pain they have and they need to be able to get the medicine quicker so they could commit suicide. And I'm feeling so small and insignificant. And what am I going to say? I'm fixing to quote Psalm 139. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. And every life is a gift from God himself. And so I know that's not going to go over too good. And so I'm starting to feel like, whoa, I hope I've done the right thing here. And I can understand why other pastors don't want to get in the lines then. And uh, then fortunately, by the grace of God, a couple of doctors got up ahead and said, there's nobody that has to go through pain that is, that is unbearable. We have enough medication now. Every pain can be resolved. Nobody needs to take a life. Life is precious. I'm thinking, thank you, Jesus. So when I finally got up there, which I was the last one, I don't know if it was by design, but as, when I finally stood up, got up there, I said to myself, you, you've got the authority of Jesus in this place. This may, this may feel like the lion's den, and it may feel like the pit of darkness, but I'm a child of God, and I've got the authority of the kingdom of God. And so I, I delivered respectfully and humbly my testimony, and Brad thought it was good. I, you, have no, you don't know how you're doing when, you, when you're done with that. I found out on Thursday that, that the Senate side had heard about the testimony and had asked if they could have a copy of my testimony read into the Senate side of the same bill. And, and so, so, so God was with me. And when we were there, we drove by Daniel House. And I got to tell you, folks, my heart still longs for Westgate Chapel to get their hands on Daniel House. I don't know how it's going to happen or if it's going to happen. But So I was stirred all day Wednesday. Pastor Bill and I prayed and we came home. We got home Wednesday night. And Thursday morning, as it so happens, which never, it's never as it so happens with God. As it so happens, I'd made a commitment weeks ago to meet three young men who are part of a video crew that works for, among other things, for, for FPIW. And they wanted to, to get, catch my heart for revival and be able to, to, to play it to other pastors in the state of Washington. And so I sat right down there where Gabe is sitting. And the cameras were there and all ready for me. It started at 8 o'clock. And it was supposed to be a 15-minute interview. And I started talking about revival. And what God wants to do in his church. And again, the Holy Spirit just kind of came all over me. And these three young guys were hungry. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know, Larry, where you got them from, but they're asking questions. And what a 15-minute interview became an hour and a half, but I don't know how they're going to use it or if they'll even use it all. But, but it took us an hour and a half. And again, I was just stirred in my heart for what I believe Jesus deserves to have. In a church that is white hot for God and full of the fire of the Holy Spirit. As it so happens, I left here with that group of, of the video group, and I went straight to Red Twig for a meeting Pastor Dave Lundquist had set up with a young Slavic pastor named Slavic, a young Ukrainian pastor named Slavic. And he, I don't know if he's in this service today, but, but uh, he's been in Ukraine for the last six, five, six, seven years, ministering before the war and since the war. And he showed me pictures of youth camps that he's running in the middle of the Ukraine right now. And in the last seven years has had 55,000 teenagers come to Christ and be deployed. (laughs) And be deployed in Eastern Europe themselves as now evangelists, white hot for God. Moving through war zones as if they did not love their lives enough to hold on to it. Oh, God. And so that just poured gasoline 
uh, on me. And I came back from that, and what was waiting for me in my office was Pastor Haile Mare, who was the Ethiopian pastor that God used so singularly in 2016. And he was sitting in my office with John and some of my family, and he had just sort of a fresh word for me and for Westgate, which, which really simply is that the revival that we've been praying for and longing for is right at hand. So what was supposed to be a one-hour meeting and with him praying over me and Pastor Rita was two and a half hours, and we almost missed Walt's farewell. And I went home Thursday night, almost kind of wrung out, you know, but certainly rekindled. I went to bed Thursday and I'm thinking, all right, I got, I'd already started the the, the chart for James 2. And it's a marvelous passage. It's in that passage where John says, I'm writing to you young men because you believe in Jesus Christ. I'm writing to you old men. I identify with that verse. And I was excited to get into it. And I thought, well, Friday's my day off, but I'm going to have to spend it in sermon prep. That's fine. Friday, Saturday, spill over to Saturday, and we'll be ready for today. And in those twilight moments between waking up and being asleep on Friday morning, about 5.30 or 6 o'clock, I hear a voice, not an audible voice, but I hear a voice, the voice of the Lord. He said, you have not been unfaithful. You've not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. And it just stirred in me all morning. I finally got up. We had breakfast. I had to go look it up. Some of you more spiritual than me might know exactly where that is. I just knew it was in the Bible somewhere. I don't know if it was, didn't know if it was Elijah or Ezekiel or or where. I had no idea it was New Testament. You've not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. I went and did a search, and I I found it. You might want to go there right now. It's actually in the book of Acts, and it's chapter 26, and it's verse 19. And let me set the context for you while you're looking for it. The apostle Paul, previously called Saul, was a persecutor of the church. Literally pulling people into prison, uh, having people executed for their faith. He was a hater of the church of Jesus Christ. And uh, God gets hold of him. But here in this passage in Acts 26, by Acts 26, Paul has already planted churches in Ephesus and Derbe and Lystra. There are elders assigned and preaching the word in all of these cities, Philippi, in the very face of the Roman Empire and its power. Paul has gone into Corinth and in places that, that, that none of us would probably venture into except the graduates of Paul Apostello. And they're going, he's gone in those places anointed by the Holy Spirit. And he's planted churches and he's, he's, he's gotten people saved, Gentiles saved. And he goes back to Jerusalem to take an offering for crying out loud so that the people, the Christians in Jerusalem who are going through a famine who could be be fed. And he gets busted in in the temple floor by antagonists and they incite a mob. That, uh, that he's been bringing Gentiles, which he had not, into the temple. And they grab him, and they're going to kill him. And the soldiers come down from Antonia Fortress and rescue him. And he's put into prison. This is the prison he's put into for a few days before they ship him off to Caesarea, where he languishes in prison for two years while waiting in his heart to move on to Rome and build a church in Rome. That's the kind of guy this is. And now he's sitting in prison, but while he's in, while he's in prison in Antonio Fortress in Jerusalem, Jesus shows up in his cell. Not a vision, not a dream. Jesus shows up in his cell and says, the mission I've sent you on, I'm, you're going to complete it, and I'm going to see you're going to get to Rome. Hang in there. You're gonna, everything's going to be fine. What, what he didn't know, he's gonna, the next two years, he's going to be sitting in prison wondering what in the world's going on with the, with the purposes of God. But, but, but God didn't fail him. He won't. 
When they got to that line, I was ready to do laps around the building. So Paul is sitting in prison now for two years, and, and, and the, the governor drags, the governor drags uh, King Agrippa, Herod Agrippa, in to just sort of almost like entertainment. Let's bring Paul out and entertain the king. So, so Paul comes out and begins to explain his life and his ministry and his calling. And then he says, look at verse 19. He says to King Agrippa, he says, so King Agrippa, I obeyed that vision from heaven. I grew up King James. My dad preached and prophesied King James. So, so I'm used to that verse in, I didn't realize even where it was, but I'm used to that verse in, I've not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. Now jump with me quickly to Acts chapter 9, because I want to just quickly, uh, I want to unpack that vision. And, and I just want you to know up front, um, I got to deliver this whole message to you. So I hope you don't have a, a pot roast waiting on you at home, at home, because I'm just telling you up front, go to Acts chapter 9. I may run a little long, but please, I'm begging you. I'm begging you, don't, don't, uh, don't, don't leave, don't duck out on me. Meanwhile, look at verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul, this is Saul before he's called Paul. Saul is uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way, followers of Jesus that he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I'm Jesus. <laughs> I'm the one you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. I want to talk to you for just a few moments, if you'll be patient with me this morning, about the heavenly vision. I just want to touch lightly on Saul's heavenly vision, but I want to show you that, he, that his heavenly vision came right after a heavenly experience. He had an encounter with God. And that encounter with God became a heavenly vision. And it's hard for you to have a heavenly vision unless you've had an encounter with God. I know a lot of our evangelical brothers and sisters and pastors out there will try to convince you that this Christian faith is simply cerebral. It's just in your mind. You just have to somehow have a belief, a belief system in scripture. And somehow God will forensically, if you have this magical belief system, erase all your sins. No, you need an experience with God. One of the problems in the American church is we've had a lot of dry-eyed, academically inspired, intellectual assessments and feigned agreements with Scripture and God that have not even begun to be conversion and deliverance from sin and brokenness and a new heart. So Paul has this knockdown off of his horse to the ground encounter. I'm not saying it always has to be dramatic, but I'm saying you need an encounter with God. And when you've had an encounter with God, God can birth a vision in you. And his encounter with God became a heavenly vision. Look at this. The men with Saul stood speechless for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now, there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias, totally different Ananias than the one that lied to the Holy Spirit. And the Lord spoke to him in a vision calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. I've shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he could see again. But Lord exclaimed Ananias. I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem, and he's authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument 
to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. That's Paul's vision. That's the heavenly vision that he got from God. And of course, he goes off in the wilderness for a period of prayer and fasting where, where God fine-tunes and shapes the vision. But please hear me this morning. The vision began with an experience with God, and then it became a heavenly vision. And Saul's heavenly vision was what he was able, in prison for crying out loud, to tell King Agrippa, I've not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. So let me transition quickly to the touchy part of this sermon, the difficult part of the sermon. Difficult for me. Because I know this is not about me. This is about Jesus. But when I was nine years old, ten years old, I received a heavenly vision. You've heard me tell the story before. My dad had taken, some of you have heard the story. My dad had taken a little church in Durban, South Africa with 35 people in it. And when he got there, dad was a little short, five foot seven, five foot six Englishman with sort of a Winston Churchill personality, uh, sort of a bulldozer. Some people, some people think I'm too forceful or whatever, but should have met my dad. <laughs> and so dad, when he saw the problems that were in this church, huge problems, immorality, stealing church money, huge and dad thought, no problem, I will preach the word of God. And I'm, I'm not belittling the preached word of God. I'm doing it right now, right? But dad just said, I'm going to preach this thing straight. And so he buckled down and for three years, he preached his heart out and nothing changed. And at the end of three years, he ended up in the Addington Hospital with ulcers bleeding so badly that the doctors really despaired of his life, but fortunately, God spared him, and he came through, and he called a family meeting. Uh, all of the family now are gone. Mom's gone. That was in that meeting. My sister's, my one sister's gone. My brother's gone. My eldest sister, very interestingly, I don't think it's a coincidence, Madge is almost 90 years old and was taken to Swedish hospital last night. She's in the intensive care. As soon as I'm done here, I got to go see her because I don't know if she's going to make it much longer. The family stood around with mom and dad talked and he said, he said, uh, your, your mom and I realize that the only thing that's going to save this church is a visitation from God. So we're going away for a month of prayer and fasting. And when we come back, if God doesn't do something here, I'm going to quit the ministry. I'll go back to being a Chevrolet dealer in the town of Peter Maritzburg. So we had the meeting. I was left in the care of my sisters and, uh, Mom and dad took off. A month later, they came back, and nothing happened for months. Everything stayed the same. We had a prayer meeting one night. Some of this I remember from what I've been told by my family. Uh, not so much, but I was 10 years old, about 10 years old when this happened, and a little, about a dozen people, and uh, no such thing as babysitters in those days. So I was at the prayer meeting, very vaguely remember it, and I, I'm, about a dozen people, dad said in the prayer meeting, and he said it was a miserable prayer meeting. The thing was dead from the beginning, and one little lady, Mrs. Momberg, bless her heart, I'm sure she's in the Lord's presence now, just kind of preached for everything, prayed for everything she could think of, and by the time she was done, my dad said to himself, this thing's dead, let's just give it a decent burial and go home. And uh, he came, we had us all come forward in a circle up front in the little sanctuary, seated about 150 people, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit spoke to my dad, and said to him, you've been here for an hour and a half, and you've, been nothing, you've done nothing but complain. Why don't you have these people worship me for a moment? And dad said with no faith, with reluctance, and just sheer obedience. He said, before we go home, let's just worship the Lord for a moment. And he started some song, hymn, something or other. And when the people started singing, it's like the, the roof of that building opened up, and the glory of the Lord came down. I have vague memories of that prayer meeting. My memories are more of the years that followed that prayer meeting. But let me tell you, people started sobbing uncontrollably. People started weeping 
with conviction of sin and began to confess sins to each other. People, people who had been feuding, two people who had been feuding for years in that church fell into each other's arms and asked for forgiveness. And that little prayer meeting alternated between worship songs, crying, weeping, and, and a couple of folks just towards the end just began laughing, just sort of holy laughter. We've all heard about it, uh, but just sort of a, it was just an incredible prayer meeting that didn't get out till midnight. And we all went home. I don't remember the conversation in the car, but I can only imagine my mom and dad saying, what, what, what just happened? What was that? Sunday when we drove, my mom told me the story. She was 92 at Krista in assisted living. Sharp as a tack, she told me the story. I'd forgotten it. When we drove to church that next Sunday in the family 49 Ford, and we rounded the corner, and the church was in the industrial district of Durban. Literally, we had a paint factory on one side of the, of the church building that smelled worse than, than a paper mill, and we had a a peanut butter factory on the other end. And some Sundays you had to deal with, am I, is this Sherman Williams I'm smelling? Or It was horrible. But when we rounded the corner, my mom reminded me, there were 200 people standing outside of the building waiting to be let in. The word of mouth had gotten out that the presence of God had shown up. And from that moment on, service after service after service was like this. Worship was suddenly, you couldn't stop it. People were just lost in the presence of the Lord. The glory of God would come down and people, dad wouldn't even get through sometimes part of his sermon. In fact, I remember some sermons where dad would get about 10 minutes into his notes and then the Holy Spirit would come on him and he would prophesy for 20 minutes. I wish to goodness we had recordings of some of those sermons as the Holy Spirit would move through him. People got saved every Sunday. We started having baptismal services every month. Within a few months, it was obvious we needed to build a new building. Fortunately, we had a couple of contractors in the church, one by the name of Philip Vandenberg. It's funny I would remember his name. And he and my dad and others literally built the church, the new church building, a 700-seat sanctuary, by pouring cement bricks. You had to pour your own cement blocks in those days and laying them up my dad had learned how to do it on the farm. And so my dad, actually, I've got a picture of him on a scaffold, built, literally building Elam Tabernacle. And 18 months later, we moved into a 700-seat sanctuary that was at capacity the day that we dedicated it. One lady, when we went back in 2009 to capture some of these stories before these people passed away, one lady, Mrs. Joe Bird, told me this story. She said, Alec, do you remember when you were nine years old, nine, ten years old? She said, and the, and the, the prayer meeting was winding down and, and people had left pretty much and you were on your way back to your dad's office. And she said there were still people praying in the altar area. She said you got halfway through the altar and the Holy Spirit came on you. And you fell on your face and began to pray in the spirit until midnight. Do you remember that? I didn't remember it. But what was happening was God was building in me. <laughs> A heavenly vision of what could be a heavenly vision of a church filled with the glory and power of God, a heavenly vision of what it means for the word of God to be preached with such conviction that you can't even get through your text and people like in the days of Charles Finney are stumbling into the altar area weeping, grown men weeping out loud to confess their sin and receive Jesus Christ. A baptistry that has to stay full of water all the time because you've got too many people to baptize. Sick bodies being healed. I was 12 or 13 years old now in the new building playing in the little, in the little orc band dad had. It's all you could call us. We weren't very good, but it was cutting edge for those days. <laughs> I was playing rhythm guitar in those days and the service, Sunday service was over. And people had pretty much left. A few folks were still there and folks in the altar area. And a man came forward to dad, for dad to pray for him. We'd known him all of our growing up years in the church. He'd had polio when he was a, when he was a child. 
and his right arm was all withered up and shriveled up. And literally, he used to carry it. Everybody wore suits in those days. And he'd actually tuck his, that withered hand in the suit pocket so the arm didn't flop around. And he came forward. I'm playing guitar. I'm watching this firsthand. And I, he's forward for dad to pray for him. And th- he just had flu or something like that. And I will never forget, as long as I live, dad reaching out and laying hands on him to pray for the flu. And suddenly, we saw him, his shoulder jerk. And his right arm just flew out of that pocket. And in front of the few hundred of us that were still there, it suddenly was the same size and the same muscle tone. Isn't that amazing that God doesn't only heal, but he provides matching muscle tone for what the other arm had been doing all of these years. That, that, that was the most dramatic physical healing that I've seen. But when you've just seen when you've just seen one, then your heart aches for, oh God, would you move in our day in such a way that we see you doing that again? And so for all the years between there and now, this vision has, has burned in me. I've shared it wherever I could. And whenever I do, it seems like the Lord is so gracious to bless it beyond my ability to preach or to articulate. And now we stand at a, as a nation at a time and place when the only hope this country is is for what happened in that little funky church in Durban, South Africa to happen again in churches all over the Pacific Northwest. And God has graced us here at Westgate Chapel to see a measure of it here from time to time, enough to whet our appetites and to keep us leaning in. And you all, for the most part, those of you who have been with us for the duration, have been so faithful to lean in to that heavenly vision and to embrace that heavenly vision because because some pastors, the vision for them involves aggressive evangelism. And for other pastors, the vision that God calls them with encompasses discipleship. And for others, it embraces teaching ministries and others. But I got to tell you, the vision for me is what God did. I saw it last week like it was, like it was vivid for me, like I've never seen it before. The, whole, the heavenly vision that God put in me, if it doesn't sound too arrogant, (laughs) God help me, too arrogant for me to say, is that the vision that was birthed in me when I was 10, 11 years old, when I was Lucas's age and sat on the front row and watched God doing this and saw all that happened, all of it happened. And then as I got a little older, I got a chance to participate in it before I came to this country. That that vision is is the heavenly vision that God has on me. And the times that I've wondered if I was to to leave the pastorate and just try to go full time with Church Awakening and share this vision, the Lord has been so clear to me. No, 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 no. Because the vision is your vision too. Some of you maybe see it more clearly than others. Some of you may be brand new and you haven't had a chance to really understand it's why it took time to share a little bit of my story with you and I don't know what he's going to have me share in the Sundays that are ahead but but I feel like what I'm what I'm supposed to do right now that God is 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 this is what highly said God is getting ready to pour out his spirit <clears throat> and he's and he's waiting for the people who have seen the vision to activate the vision The vision of God's presence that we've seen and experienced so frequently here. The vision of the word of God coming alive and and us having an insatiable appetite for every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. 
the vision for worship. And we're seeing, folks, we're seeing it. I'm, these tears are not tears of, of I'm discouraged because, no, no, we're seeing elements of it and have, by God's grace, since we started prayer meetings 30 years ago. But what I want to sort of pass on to you today by way of closing this service, and this is how I'm going to close. What I want to pass on to you today some of you have already fully embraced the vision and you're saying, Pastor, that's my vision. It's what, it's what God showed me. It's, what I, it's why I'm here. Some of you are here because of that vision. I feel like for the first time, all of our pastors here are here because of that vision. Not my vision, God's vision. But Westgate Chapel has been given a divine assignment to carry this vision so that you're able to say, it is my heavenly vision. And yes, it may have different expressions depending on where your giftings are and where your callings are. It may have different expressions. Not all the pastoral staffs, fortunately, giftings are like mine or, or, or callings like mine. But, but, but right now, you are here, especially those of you who are brand new. God has brought you here, whether you can put this into words or not, God has brought you here to be obedient to his heavenly vision. And the vision is a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit. With worship being fresh and new. The word of God being powerful like a double-edged sword. Brotherly love between us coming to a whole new level. Gifts of the Spirit deployed in us and through us inside the walls and outside of the walls. Nobody a bystander. Nobody sitting by the sideline. Everybody engaged in the intercession in your homes and in your lives, in your families. Praying, oh God, send the Northwest a powerful, earth-shaking outpouring of your Holy Spirit. And God's call for you today is to embrace this vision and say, Amen. And the way I want you to do it is we're going to come to the communion tables. This, we're going to, the orchestra, the band's going to play for us. There'll be some background music. Just talk to the Holy Spirit. Ask him right now, am I ready to embrace this heavenly vision? And if you're ready, when you're ready is a sign of your reestablishing with God. Jesus cut this covenant for you on the cross. He said, whenever you do this, drink the cup and eat the bread. Remember me, enter into, and then enter into me all over again. And as you enter into Jesus all over again in these elements, I want you to just tell him, Lord, I'm in. I'm in. And as we get ready to close, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head back to my office in just a moment, only because I don't want anybody feeling like I'm looking to see who's coming to the communion tables. we got some of the balcony, and if you're gluten intolerant, there's a table all the way over on my left, your right, that has the gluten-free. But in 1839, a massive revival swept through Kilsith, Scotland. And from Kilsith, it went to the whole nation. And within a short few months, the whole nation was, was drawn into a powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit with all of the elements I've just described to you that I experienced as a child. And the reason this vision, by the way, I might not have said this, the, re the reason this vision is so vivid and so real in me is because I've experienced it. I'm not just trying to draw you into a vision based on history books. I'm not trying to draw you into a vision based on what Leonard Ravenhill wrote, as wonderful as his books are, or what people have pontificated about revival. And I don't say this arrogantly before the Lord. In the sovereignty of God, he put me in a family and in a city and in a church that he poured out his spirit. And I experienced revival for seven years until I left to come to this country to go to Bible college. So this is a heavenly vision that I've had personal experience with. And these pastors, a bunch of them got together in Edinburgh after this Kilsith revival was in its full swing in 1840. And they held lectures to try to discern how did this revival start? And before I call you to prayerfully come and take communion as an indication before God, of your willingness to, to embrace this vision, this heavenly vision. It's a heavenly vision. 
Too many people right now around the country are saying God is getting ready to pour out his Holy Spirit. More people are saying it than I've ever, ever heard in this country in all the years I've been here. I'm convinced God's getting ready to do it. And when it comes, it's gonna come suddenly. Suddenly, this parking lot will be full. Suddenly, we'll be asking Christians to give up their seats for unbelievers that want to get in here and get saved. Suddenly, we'll see people getting healed in unprecedented ways. Suddenly, the prodigals are going to come home. Suddenly, drug addicts and homosexuals are going to come in here and be delivered and set free. But for that suddenly to come, I believe what God said to me on Thursday, for that suddenly to come, he needs ambassadors of it, more than just me. I can't do this by myself. The board can't do it. Our pastors can't do it by themselves. He needs ambassadors. Some of you have bought in just spiritually down through the years, but we're asking, we're ask, I'm asking you, are you ready to be an ambassador to the Lord for a heavenly vision? Those of you going overseas, you carry that same DNA with you. You'll be an ambassador wherever God sends you. But let me just unpack quickly and, I, and thank you for being so patient with me three things that these scottish ministers said was the reason for the 1839 this is what preceded the 1839 outbreak of the holy spirit in scotland one the attention of the church was earnestly called to the subject of revival by public discourses i.e preaching so the preachers of scotland by the Holy Spirit's prompting, like I'm doing today, drew the attention of congregations around Scotland to the need for revival. That's number one. Number two, the records of, this is old English, right? The records of what glorious things the Lord had wrought amongst us and which our fathers had told us of were recovered from neglect and sent through the length and breadth of the land. We've got a whole library of Richard Owen Roberts on old books on revival. When we have the conference here, the pastor's conference in March, you need to get some for yourself. But we gotta get these stories out. I, I read this to every pastor I can. Get the stories of old revivals. Doesn't mean God's gonna do that exactly, the new thing like he did before, it doesn't matter. What it does is it stirs a hunger. God, if you did it in 1839, how about 2023? So the people were envisioned by the stories. It's probably what I'm going to spend time on in future Sundays. And then thirdly, the Lord's people were stirred up for private prayer, family prayer, united prayer, and public prayer for this special object of a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Westgate, both the 9 o'clock and 11.15 service. You've been patient with me. You've been gracious. And now I just ask, are you willing to be ambassadors with me? Because I'm not slowing down. By the grace of God, I'm not backing up. I'm not sitting down. By God's grace, we'll go together. We'll go together to the promised land.